Another prevalent form of performative allyship in the quest for decolonization is the vocal advocacy for Indigenous rights that stops short of advocating for structural changes needed to actualize those rights. Advocating for rights sounds commendable, but without the hard work of dismantling and rebuilding the structural inequalities within our society, it's as unstable as this tower of blocks. True advocacy requires a dedication to substantial and systemic change. All too often, we witness organizations and individuals supporting Indigenous rights initiatives, be it in healthcare, education, or legal reform. Yet this advocacy seems to dissipate when it comes to making deep institutional changes. Genuine structural change might involve fundamental shifts in policy-making processes, like including Indigenous voices in decision-making roles or altering the very frameworks that govern our institutions. Without these changes, advocacy remains merely a declaration of support, one that doesn't shake the foundation of a structure built on historical oppression and inequality. True allies work toward integrating Indigenous perspectives and models of governance in a way that transcends mere advocacy. For instance, structural change in education doesn't just involve acknowledging the educational disparities faced by Indigenous peoples. It requires a transformation of the educational system to incorporate Indigenous languages, traditions, and histories, reshaping the curriculum and pedagogy from the ground up. Within the legal system, it's not enough to decry injustices faced by Indigenous peoples. Structural change means reforming the legal system itself to recognize Indigenous law and legal traditions. Advocacy for rights without advocating for structural change misses the mark for what it means to be an ally in the journey of decolonization. It's an example of performative allyship that veils itself in good intentions, but ultimately perpetuates the comfortable distance from the systemic upheaval that is required. Structural change in the realm of research would involve embracing methodologies that decentralize Western paradigms, considering ethics and reciprocity as foundational to the research process, one that is cyclical, respectful, and co-constructed, giving back as much as it garners, and founded on principles of mutual benefit and respect. If research is to be a genuine form of allyship, it must weave together different ways of knowing. It must go beyond performative allyship and towards a praxis of decolonization that is lived, experienced, and mutually empowering. As scholars, researchers, and learners, we must continually interrogate our practices, ensuring our quest for knowledge contributes to the decolonization process, not hamper it. While initiatives that claim to support decolonization are often well-received, there lies a fundamental problem with such efforts when they prioritize comfort, over the substantive change required. If decolonizing efforts are designed in a way that safeguards the existing privileges and power structures, then they fall short of the mark. Decolonization, by its very nature, should challenge and discomfort those who are a part of the dominant culture that has benefited from colonization. When comfort is prioritized, the painful history and ongoing impact of colonial structures are glossed over in favor of reforms that may appear progressive, but do not disturb the foundational inequalities. For instance, educational reforms that incorporate Indigenous authors into reading lists, but do not address the systemic bias in the academic institution, maintain a comfortable status quo. They do little to shift the power dynamics 
or hegemonic discourse that has long dictated the terms of educational achievement and respect for different knowledge systems. Performative efforts in the legal sector might result in token representation of Indigenous peoples or the symbolic appointment of Indigenous figures to advisory committees without granting them real decision-making power or opportunities to enact change. These superficial gestures allow institutions to check off boxes, claiming progress without unsettling the bedrock of comfort that underpins the colonial system. This approach does a disservice to the transformative potential of decolonization and, in fact, constitutes a regressive step, one that reinforces the colonial narratives and practices under the guise of change. We must therefore question and critically examine every decolonizing effort, asking ourselves who truly benefits from these actions and what structural inequalities remain unchanged. The challenge is to move beyond performative allyship to a practice that is uncomfortable, but that lays the groundwork for real decolonization, the repatriation of land, the dismantling of systemic injustices, the redistribution of resources, all these require more than comfort. They require courage, conviction, and most importantly, action that might not be comfortable at all. Let's shift our focus to the potential that resides in privileged individuals when they actively engage in a decolonization process. The influence held by those in privileged positions when directed with intent and commitment can indeed catalyze significant progress. Privileged individuals often have access to resources, platforms, and networks that, if mobilized, can amplify the call for decolonization and bring about substantive change. Their involvement can lend weight to the advocacy for Indigenous rights and sovereignty. It's crucial, however, that this involvement be predicated on a sincere willingness to listen, learn, and act in ways that redress rather than reinforce the historical and systemic disparities caused by colonialism. Involved privileged individuals can positively impact decolonization by supporting Indigenous-led initiatives and leveraging their positions to advocate for policy changes that benefit Indigenous communities. Additionally, Privileged allies can use their influence to open spaces for Indigenous voices in areas where they have traditionally been marginalized or silenced. This isn't just about sharing space. It's about transferring the power and control of that space to those to whom it rightfully belongs. When privileged individuals yield space, actively listen, and support, they validate the leadership and inherent sovereignty of Indigenous peoples. Moreover, privileged individuals can contribute to decolonization by critically examining their own practices, biases, and the structures that have afforded them their privilege in the first place. They are in a position to challenge their peers to do the same, thereby fostering a broader culture of accountability. This willingness involves recognizing that privilege has insulated them from many of the harsh realities faced by Indigenous peoples. It also means understanding that their normal, the default societal settings that work in their favor, is not neutral, but a product of colonial power structures. It requires privileged individuals to enter into relationships with Indigenous peoples that are based on respect, equality, and the understanding that they may need to give up their seats at the table to make room for Indigenous leaders. These actions exhibit a realignment of power dynamics and a redistribution of resources. When privileged individuals support Indigenous governance and embrace systems of accountability, they are actively part of the decolonization work. The decolonization process is not a zero-sum game. It's a necessary precondition for a just society, and it's about righting historical and current contemporary wrongs. 
For decolonization to be more than a theoretical ideal, privileged individuals may embody the willingness to relinquish the benefits bestowed unfairly by colonial structures. Only with such readiness can we hope to achieve a truly decolonized world.